The first several years of my life, a few of my older relatives passed away. So from a young age, I was introduced to the reality of death, and I understood that someday we're all going to die. Around the age of seven, I found myself fascinated and disturbed even more with the reality of death. It bothered me deeply. I knew someday my life would come to an end, and that upset me. Even though I came from a Christian home where I was taught about an afterlife, at the same time, I had been somehow influenced by the atheist mindset that when we die, that's it, and we cease to exist. So I was believing this, and I was very sad. I knew someday I was going to die, and this led me into thinking about eternity. I expressed this concern to my mum, which led to a conversation with a family friend. This family friend was not a Christian. She was an agnostic, but she told me about how she had had an out-of-body experience on the operating table, and she had been looking down on her own body, watching the doctors operate on her. My dad also shared with me a similar story about a guy he knew who had an out-of-body experience when he was trapped in a digger when a bank caved in. He was looking down on the caved-in bank and could see the digger arm sticking out of the bank. So I came to the conclusion that there was a supernatural realm and an afterlife which gave me peace for a time. Up until that point, I did believe in the Christian God, and I had some understanding of Jesus dying on the cross for my sin, and I suppose I believed it, but I didn't really understand it. I didn't really understand anything about the cross and Jesus' sacrifice for our sins. I had not heard the full salvation message. I also knew nothing about sin, redemption, eternal life, hell, or eternal judgment. I was not born again. Several months later, in January 2003, I was still seven years old. We were at the dinner table as a family one night, and we got talking about Christian things and Christianity in general. This resulted in my parents explaining the full salvation message to us. This is the basic salvation message. In the beginning of creation, one of God's angels became full of pride and set himself up in opposition to God. There was a rebellion in heaven. That angel was Satan, also known as the adversary or the evil one. On earth, Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, lived in the Garden of Eden, where there were two trees, the tree of life, which they could eat from, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which they were forbidden to eat from. If they did this, they would then intimately know good and evil, and they would die. Satan entered the garden and deceived them into eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When they did this, sin entered the world, and they died spiritually. Therefore, they were destined someday to die physically, but God had a plan to save people. He set apart the nation of Israel to represent him to the world. He also had them sacrifice animals to atone for sin and to show how because God is a holy God, our sin requires the shedding of blood. It requires the death penalty. The animal sacrifices were only to foreshadow the sacrifice, which would be to end all sacrifices and truly clear us of our sin, a lamb without blemish. So God took human form as Jesus Christ, born of a virgin and ministered on earth. He was the Messiah and the Savior. He was fully God, so he could be without sin, and he was truly man, so he could represent mankind as their substitute, taking the punishment we all deserve. He was unjustly condemned to death and crucified on a Roman cross. When he did this, he paid the penalty for our sin. God then raised him from the dead to show he was innocent and to prove that his sacrifice was sufficient. We are declared righteous before God and our sins are forgiven on the basis of Jesus' atoning sacrifice for our sin. It is by grace that is undeserved, unmerited favor received through faith. Salvation is by faith, not by works of the Old Testament law 
or works of righteousness. Salvation is by trusting in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made on the cross for our sin. The Bible teaches that we are to continue trusting in him. The Bible says we will be saved only if we go on believing. This is not a one-time decision. Now, while we're not saved by our works of righteousness, this faith is a repentant faith. That means it is preceded by or associated with a conviction of our sin, a godly sorrow for our sin, and a change of heart attitude towards sin, and an inward resolve to turn away from our sin. With this will be a willingness to confess our sin. The names of those who repent and place their trust in Jesus are written in the Lamb's book of life. One day, Jesus will return and the dead will be raised. The books will be opened and everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God. Those whose names are not in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire with Satan and his angels. Those whose names are in the book of life continue in everlasting life in all its fullness with Jesus and other believers. My parents spoke to us about walking with Jesus and how Jesus knocks on the door of our hearts, convicting us and challenging us to make a decision to turn to him and place our trust in him. I definitely felt like Jesus was knocking on the door of my heart. The Holy Spirit was convicting me and challenging me to make a decision. I said I wanted to know Jesus and have everlasting life. My parents led us through a salvation prayer where we confessed our sin, we repented of our sin, we made confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and his sacrifice for us on the cross and his shed blood. We called upon the name of the Lord. My parents also anointed us with anointing oil and I remember trembling with what I believe was the presence of the Holy Spirit and the joy and assurance of knowing my sins were forgiven and that even though I may die physically, I will go straight to heaven and someday be resurrected and never die ever again. I felt a peace inside and was filled with God's love and joy. I believe water baptism should be one of the first things we do in our Christian walk. It should be sought early on. In the New Testament, they usually did this the same day they placed their faith in Jesus. I didn't receive water baptism until I was in my early teens, but that was just because I didn't know any better. That's when I learned that baptism was a command, and that's when I fully understood the meaning of water baptism. However, I understood the basics of salvation from the age of seven, and I do believe that's when I was born again. That's when I became a believer, and that's when I was justified and forgiven of my sin. And I was passionate about Jesus Christ and the new life I had. At times I told people about Jesus and I talked to them about their eternity and where they were going to spend it. I urged people to turn to Christ. I wanted everyone to be saved and no one to be lost. I wanted everyone to have everlasting life and experience the relief that I had. I wanted everyone to know the same awesome loving God who cared about me enough to save me from eternal death, who wouldn't leave me in the grave, even though being the sinner I am, I deserved his wrath. I made a lot of mistakes and I was far from perfect. I had my ups and downs, but I knew I was saved by grace through faith, not of works or by the Old Testament law. I loved God. I loved Jesus. I loved the salvation message. I did have a zeal for righteousness. I was determined to pursue holiness and upright character. The forgiveness of sins and eternal life was what the cross did for me. The passion for the Lord, the zeal for righteousness and the love for others was what the cross did in me. I was a changed person with a new heart. And I would say there was a supernatural transformation. I was a new person and a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old person was being put to death. This continued all through into my teenage years. When I was heading down a wrong path, the Holy Spirit would often convict me deep inside. I would realize the error of my ways and I would confess it to him and ask God's forgiveness. Partway through my last year at high school, my group class teacher, who was a charismatic Christian, got me involved with starting a lunchtime group with 
a group of Christians. So the group never really grew, but I learned a lot in that time. My teacher began to speak to us about the need to move in the power of the Holy Spirit. He talked to us about the gifts of the Spirit, and he shared with me prophetic words about things I was going to do in the future, and he singled me out in regard to the calling on my life. He said how we should be praying for God to fill us with the Holy Spirit, and he mentioned tongues, and he spoke in tongues in front of us. And for anyone who doesn't know, according to the Bible, tongues, which just means languages in the Greek, is the Holy Spirit enabling you to be able to pray in another language. I understand this to be languages of men or angels, which may be used publicly with a Holy Spirit given interpretation, or it may be used privately for personal edification without the need for interpretation. I remember trying to imitate him just to see if I could, but I was not capable of it. I had a traditional evangelical understanding that you receive the Holy Spirit when you're born again, and with that you receive anything you're ever going to receive. I also didn't have much interest in tongues. I assumed that if I were to speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit would take control of my mouth and that I would understand the meaning of the words coming out of my own mouth. I didn't realize tongues could be used without interpretation for private personal edification. And I assumed they were only ever accompanied by interpretation in a public setting. So I wasn't seeking tongues in particular, but regarding the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I did decide to go along with him and I asked God for this regularly whenever I had a spare moment over the period of weeks. One day, weeks later, when I was on the ride on lawnmower, where I would often meditate on God's word, I began to find myself wanting to speak out these foreign sounding words that didn't make any sense to me. And it was like the Holy Spirit was giving me utterance to speak in a language I didn't understand. It began to flow out of me like a language, like a stream. I also found myself trembling like when I was born again at the age of seven. I thought to myself, man, I feel really good when I speak out in this gibberish. Man, I feel like I'm speaking in some kind of language and I'm enjoying it. And I felt really at peace. I also found this pure, controllable, but almost supernatural laughter and joy bubbling up within me. And I remember getting the subconscious thought, which I believe was a word of knowledge, that I was speaking in tongues. And I was thinking, is this tongues? And then I thought, nah, surely this is not tongues. I'm in control of myself and I don't understand what I'm saying. I thought this could be dodgy. I'll just stop. But I didn't want to. It felt good. So I went to school and I asked my teacher a whole lot of annoying questions. And I wanted to be certain that this phenomenon I was experiencing was actually tongues. And he, he got fed up with me asking him questions. So I spoke in tongues in front of him and he confirmed that what I was experiencing was tongues as he would describe it. He also referred to my experience as the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as many Pentecostal Christians do. So I went to look this up online and in researching the baptism in the spirit, I came across a man called Derek Prince, who I already knew of, and I listened to his teaching on receiving the Holy Spirit, and he thoroughly, and I believe biblically, explained in detail the phenomenon I had just experienced a few days earlier. And I was on my own when it happened. I was astounded and in denial at the time because it wasn't what I expected, but it certainly was not something I was manipulated into. Following this experience, I also found I was able to memorize Bible verses. And when I was at youth group during the Bible discussion, I could come out with deep ideas beyond my natural ability and quote Bible verses I had memorized off the top of my head. This was a powerful supernatural experience. It was following this that I found myself going deeper in my study of and hunger for God's word. I'm very thankful to God for this. We need the Holy Spirit, his presence and his power in our lives. If you're not a believer, then I hope that what I have shared will lead you to the truth of Jesus Christ. And if you're already a believer, I hope that it will be of some help and encouragement to you in your walk with the Lord.
You've been listening to part one of my testimony where I have shared with you how I became a Christian and how I was filled with the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. You can also listen to part two in a separate video where I share how I was delivered from demons. Thank you for listening to this testimony and may God bless you.